It's like the other way somehow exists as well. And so with that, and when you're doing multiple things, it's like how do you balance your time and energy so that you feel like you're doing it the best you can with each of those projects that you're working on. And that's a continual process for me. So whether it's Cavani, Kuroga, or you know Casa, the group I play with, them, with my friends, it does take energy, time and energy. And it is, it is a balance to figure out how that fits together. But I would say for me, just a second ago, you're talking about like going back to North Carolina and like searching for, for things in, in the big city and, and these, you know, these places, the, the destination point I think, or I, I want to tell myself is always like, is always inside. It's never like something external outside, right? So it's like the further you go in and like further pursue that destination, which is your vision, which is, you know, I, I have this vision of I'm going to do this or this or X, Y, Z. That leads you, that brings your, your physical self places. That's what keeps it going. And so you could be anywhere in the world, small town, big town, whatever. But if you feel like you're pursuing that like authentically, then I feel like it over time it catches on and then people, people want to be a part of that or they find it interesting. Welcome everybody to the Faking Notes, Notes Podcast. We Ooh. back once again. Today's episode was, you know, characteristic of a typical Faking Notes Podcast episode in that it was stellar. If I do say so myself, we had <laughs> the wonderful uh, Kyle Price. He is a founder, executive, and artistic director of the Kroga Arts Collective. He's the cellist of the extraordinary Cavani quartet and he is a basketball aficionado he had so much wisdom to share we really dig into his connection to sports and how that ties into the physical aspects of playing and also playing on a team and how that relates to chamber music and he's accomplished so much playing in in quartets and, and chamber music and yet he's also a, a founder of a very successful music festival that's now grown into like a full-blown arts collective. We dig into this journey that he takes from a little fun thing for his friends as a sophomore, all the way to million dollar donations, playing at town halls and getting a mu an amusement park donated to him. It's just a wild journey. And he dreams, he's living the dream and he, he's dreamed the life that he wants to have. There's so much wisdom in here. You're going to love this one. So uh, before we get into it, just remember, subscribe if you like these. If you like these episodes, you want more of them to drop into your uh, your little uh, playlist. And also, you know, review us. Like we love, um, we love reviewing and reading our reviews live here. We've gone through all of them. So if you want to hear your voice here on the podcast, you know, uh, drop us a, a review and a five stars only. Five stars only. I mean, that's that's all we accept here. If you want to talk to us in between the episodes, come join us on our Discord. All these links are in the show notes. And if you happen to have a little bit of extra cha-ching, cha-ching, and you'd like to support us, another direct way to support us is on our Patreon. So come through. We've got all these events off pod and just become a part of the Faking Fam. Join us in the community. We love hearing from you. Without further ado, let's get into our conversation with the one, the only, Kyle, Kyle Price. Price. <laughs> Let's jump right in. So between the Feltzenkrais method, your body is your strad, and uh, your love and practice of basketball, I'd love for you to dig in a little bit more about like the physical aspects of music. Let's talk sports shop. Yeah, I would love to. For me, like sports was a big part of my upbringing. Uh, my dad is like a, a big sports lover. You know, he is a environmental engineer, not a, not a musician, and I, I remember. Growing up, I was really interested in like both um, playing sports, like doing five different sports. I was playing like two different instruments and 
composing music. My mom is a musician. And so I just had these kind of influences on both sides. And my mom was also like really uh, into sports as well uh, in her own way. My dad loved music and would have me listen to like ACDC when I was like probably too young, but it was, it was dope. And, <laughs> and so, you know, I, I had these really cool um, mixtures to, to experience. And I remember my sister was taking ballet class actually. Uh, and I thought it was really cool. And, and my dad told me a lot of basketball players took ballet when they were younger. So I, I was like, all right, well, I got to take ballet next, I guess. So I was, I think I was maybe been like six or seven years old. I started doing ballet mm. and I, it was really interesting because I think it taught me kind of a lot about basketball in the sense of the balletic aspects of basketball. Um, and I have to say when you're nine and you have like a, a really dope vertical, it makes you like much better as an athlete, uh, than the rest of the kids around you. Uh, but, um, also for cello, your body awareness becomes just much different. And for me, the kinesthetic elements, I think helped me get better at both things simultaneously. You know, eventually life gravitated one way or another, but it's always been something that's that's really connected both sides. I found like when I focused on basketball, I got better at cello. And when I focused on cello, I got better at basketball. And it was only when I let go of one or the other for a long amount of time did I feel like something just wasn't quite right, which is interesting. You know what's so fascinating about hearing you talk about this? Um, have you ever had a conversation with Jeff Natal, uh, First Violence of St. Lawrence? Yeah, not specifically about this, but uh, Jeff Jeff and I go way back because um, he taught at my mom's program, Chambers of Connection. St. Lawrence came and did like a guest uh, master class. When I was a freshman at uh, Mercer University at uh, Robert McDuffie, uh, St. Lawrence came in and I, I played the Mendelssohn uh, Octet with them. Yeah. But we it was cool because the McDuffie Center for Strings was doing a kind of like – co for this concert it was like this co like collaboration with like the mm. um the basketball team uh <laughs> and so the basketball team came to our concert and we the center went and played for the uh the national anthem and for the halftime of the basketball team oh, and we so went cool. to go perform there and jeff jeff was talking about like the connection like you are between basketball and music and it's just so interesting hearing your perspectives because they, they're echoing a lot of what Jeff says. It's like that the fact that you're playing basketball helps you connect to your body, connect your mind to your body. And that isn't something that takes away from your play, uh, your playing. It's just additive. And I'm wondering, like, in terms of basketball, are there some similarities in the way that you practice basketball that are similar to how you practice uh, your cello? Yeah, 100%. Um, I think. Actually, for me, taking your rhythmics, and so rhythmics, some of you might know, is like essentially a study of rhythm and, and body with rhythm. And uh, the first time I did that really intensely was at CIM in my undergraduate. And I remember it was so interesting because uh, I felt like my dribbling skills got so much better by taking mm. your rhythmics. Mm. Um, and actually, my rhythmics got better too because I used to practice um with a basketball like just sitting in cim dorm room and i especially we do this thing cosmic whole note where you know it's like one click and then maybe like 32 seconds later then another click and you have to clap with it and i would practice by dribbling underneath my legs for like x amount of times and then i would clap and then i eventually i'd let go of the ball but in the rhythmic room i'd still do the same motion so with that there's like a rhythm element to basketball that comes in with anticipating what others are doing, which in chamber music is obviously super helpful. Um, like keeping your eyes up while you're dribbling. There's understanding people's emotional states. Like is a defender really, you know, aggressive with you when they're playing? And if so, can you like use that to your advantage? Um, or if a musician is kind of signaling something to you um, with their playing, they're leaning in, or they have this certain facial expression, like how can you respond with your sound to like make that blend? So this kind of team element, I think, can be uh, applied in both basketball and chair music. And so, you know, it really allowed me to, I think, identify with both things um, with like similar concepts and similar techniques. 
could you tell us about um since you're dribbling in the dorm room uh your downstairs neighbor like what that relationship was like, like it's just <laughs> yeah it's a good uh you know i had a long history of pranking in the dorms so oh, i don't know how my relationship was with with most people in the dorms uh no i i think they were super nice uh to me but i yeah my just one quick side note to that bring it since you brought it up my roommate and I, I think it was the first week at CIM, uh, we decided instead of going out uh, for this kind of like, you know, first week at college uh, shindig that people were having, uh, we decided we're going to stay in. No one really knew their dorm numbers still and all the floors are, look exactly the same. So they only knew it because their name tag was on the door, right? It's first week of school. So we're like, you know, every floor looks the same and they're all going to come back super late. <laughs> let's just switch all the floors name tags. So let's switch the fourth and third floor, second and first floor. So when they come back, they think they're on the wrong floor and then it was be really funny. And so we, we did this and the next morning someone, you know, we were walking, just going to the restroom or whatever. Um, and this guy at CIM was like, yo, dude, did you see what happened last night? It's like, no one knew where the rooms were. And like, I was like, what? That's crazy. Crazy. What? Uh, anyway, eventually um, I figured it out. And then the whole dorm dumped a bunch of glitter in our room. So I think I still have glitter on my clothes. So that's my relationship with my, my dorm mates at CIM. So the, the dribbling was not as, as bad as that, probably. Got it. They were that's like, glorious. I'll take the dribbling. Yeah. <laughs> There's something about that, too, that reminds me of a sports camp prank. Like, you're hanging out with the team, you're, you're trolling the guys, and I think that's something, like, fun that we, to some degree, can miss out on music, where it's just, it's always so serious, and it's those little things. I bet you that someone still thinks about that prank to this day, more so than anything they learned their freshman year or something <laughs> like that. Like, like, it's those formative things that really stick with you so yeah well uh, you know i wouldn't tell the cim faculty that but you know i i could understand that for sure yeah <laughs> we'll, we'll keep that on the dl for you right I, yeah. I wanted to because you're such a basketball fan and i growing up i played a ton of basketball have i've like twisted and sprained my left ankle like at least seven times so like i it's it's very near and dear to my heart where were you? Can you talk about where you were and what you were doing when you found out about Kobe? Man, I was in, I remember very well. I was just finishing rehearsal at UT Knoxville, the main campus there with Cavani, we're doing Mendel Octet, And I got a bunch of text messages. <clears throat> and I mean, you know, I think it's just, you know, we, we all, we're big basketball fans. So we immediately reached out to our fellow community. And, and even yeah. if you're not a basketball fan, I think people were just reaching out to each other. Mm. And I, I remember like double and triple taking on my phone being like, no, it's not, no. that's not true. Mm -hmm. And that was crazy. That night I stayed up for like hours, just like watching the TV being like, how is that possible? Like, I think that was what it taught me at least. And maybe for others too, is like some, someone and something so invincible is like there's there's something nothing lasts forever you know and you want to be grateful for what's around you in the moment and not take it for granted because like he was bigger than life in so many ways mm -hmm. and like just like that he's gone and i think for everyone you know it, it was just a lot to take in that's such a good question though yeah man i i, I remember as well i was um backstage People in the podcast have heard this, so I apologize if you're hearing this again. <laughs> but uh, it was at the Staples Center mm. and for the Grammys, and I was leaving rehearsal. And then we got back to one of the box seats, which is where we were keeping our instruments, because we weren't allowed to have our phones during rehearsal. Because, mm. you know, Ariana Grande was like, no, <laughs> you're not <laughs> taking selfies with me in the background. Yeah. yeah. So we get back, and we're looking at our phones, and it's like TMZ. So we're all talking shit. It's like, ah, oh, it's TMZ. Right. But then ESPN was like talking about it. And then so yeah. a bunch of like my friend, uh, Tom Lee, he's part of the Ficking fam. He, he was on the podcast and, and like he told me 
And I remember just the two of us and a couple of other dudes just kind of like just sitting together for like 10 minutes in silence. We just, we just couldn't believe it. So. Well, also just thinking about, I don't know if you've seen his animated short film, like John Williams did this. Yeah, John Williams with, did it. I highly encourage anyone listening to go watch. Um, like Kobe was like a brilliant artistic mind. I mean, I, I have to say like I'm from like Columbus, Cleveland area, right? So LeBron is obviously... Yeah, yeah, but, yeah. But but that being said, like Kobe was really special. Like artistically, he had great imagination. He was a brilliant guy, and and I feel like that this little short animated film, John Williams did the soundtrack to, really gives you an insight to that that mindset he had. And uh, so it's it's just a bummer we can't experience, you know, what what it would have been um, had he keep pursuing the film kind of uh, music realm. Uh, but I hope, you know, I hope he inspired a lot of people to kind of do that, especially athletes, because that's the other takeaway, I think, uh, for me growing up was there's a lot of really creative athletes, but also I feel like there's a big dissonance there because athletes aren't always encouraged to express their feelings in such a way. So um, first of all, they get a little bit like, weird to other people expressing like i play the cello like they might be like you know oh that's that's kind of weird but (laughs) (laughs) but i feel like people like kobe and even you know nba players now and college players are starting to get more open to being accepting of like you know people who are in the arts and like what that's like and respecting that it's like a creative field that people are driven to do so something something like that. that's great i'm also curious too because it seems like this is something that actually goes both ways because we're all interested in sports and athletics. I'm also a huge LeBron fan, but yet we know so many musicians who they, you don't have to, there's no requirement to be interested in sports at all. You know, good for you. You, you get mm-hmm. Sundays back, you get, you get weeknights back, you get to do other things. <laughs> you don't have to like get all anxious and like ruin the rest of your day when your team loses, even though you don't do anything for that team, but <laughs> it, yeah. it, you feel it. Well, I see so many musicians that every time sports ball comes in, we got to dunk on the Super Bowl and you got to tweet <laughs> about how you're not watching the Super Bowl and how proud you are to like b- brag about your your uninterest in sports. But I'm, I'm slowly starting to see more and more musicians being open about their other interests and particularly in sports, those who are playing it. And I just love circling back to how you opened up like this kind of connection and how when you were working on one, the other would improve or you'd start missing mm-hmm. it. And uh, I think, at least for Drew and I, it resonates for both of us, like long time listeners of this pod, they know, like we're interested and we in fact encourage growing in other areas mm-hmm. as a way to actually improve in music and improving in music mm-hmm. as a way to improve outside of music. So it is neat seeing these high level athletes showing interest elsewhere going beyond what they're interested in. I mean, you get Nadamik and Sue like tweeting about finance and something. Right. <laughs> and you're getting, you're getting uh, the Chicago Bulls going to the opera. I'm not even going to the opera. And <laughs> Well, I, I think with that, there's social implications for the younger generation. Like I was thinking about high school, you know, for me, um, it was challenging. I'm not going to say it was like not challenging. I and mean, I was like, on the varsity basketball team and there's these expectations that you spend every you know minute of your life during those seasons toward basketball and meanwhile like senior auditions are happening for like conservatories and i'm having to choose like okay well i'm gonna miss this like you know game or like whatever and and trying to like schedule that and, and articulate to my coaches like yeah this is important to me this is why i'm doing this um and and I, I'm confident I made the right right choices overall, um, but there's certainly I think now uh, even I would hope more of an appreciation that coaches and players have to accept their fellow teammates who who are interested in doing other things and doing more, uh, and and let's just flip that too people who are just so dedicated on music. And feeling like that's all you can do if you're going to be successful, you know, challenging them to have life experiences outside of that, that then they can bring into their music. And I mean, I think Drew does this well. I, a fan from afar and, and Drew and I have a set, we've, 
it's ships through the night. Like we have so many mutual friends we haven't met yet, but to use like life experiences and, and these journeys and put that into your creative, like music making as a way to express and share stories through your music to the audience, I think it creates another layer for me as a performer and, and hopefully for the audience member as well. Yeah, it's so Beautiful. funny. You're echoing something one of our uh, previous guests, Yaz, talks about. She said to like go out and love people and experience life and get your heart broken because maybe you're trying to make music right now, but it's not. It doesn't mean anything. And then you're able to take your life experience and implant that into your music. And then it creates this broader, you can put some actual blood into it. My, one of my teachers at Mercer once said like, you won't really play Brahms well until you get your heart broken. Like you you won't really grasp it. And that always stuck with me because I, I started playing Brahms before I got my heart broken, had it broken and I return to it like almost every year. And it always, always means a little bit more. And I can always put a little bit more blood into it. So I, mm-hmm. I love that. I wanted to maybe use that as a way to segue from, you know, music I'm, or, uh, you know, sports and, and using your corporeal form to create physical art into this musical art. And you're living a life that i am very envious of you you play chamber music as an aspect of your as of your career with not only just any quartet but the cavani quartet my man <laughs> can you in as much detail as possible talk about the story of uh being accepted into the quartet and like what it took and and the story behind that sure um cavani quartet first of all are just hugely influential to me and I, i'm speaking not 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 talking about myself right now <laughs> to, to, to clarify to clarify i studied with uh mary peckham at cim who is the original member of the cavani quartet and i was also at that time i was at cim i was teaching kirsten uh the violist of cavani I was teaching her uh one of her sons to play cello I was babysitting Mari, the second violinist, kids, and Annie is like a second mom to me. So it was, you know, that was, they were just a huge influence in my life. I've known them since I was essentially born. My mom is friends with them. And so they would come down to Columbus, where I'm originally from, and they would do uh, workshops and teach. And mm-hmm. and then obviously were a huge part of me deciding to go to CIM, which, you know, the chamber music was a, a big draw at CIM. And that's where really my heart was, partially because of chair music connection, where my mom started this program in Columbus that Jeff Myers from the Caldor Quartet came out of Eva Kennedy, um, Meredith Kovchek. You know, there's many, <laughs> I'm forgetting a lot. It's a well-known program, and I was lucky to grow up in it. And so anyway, it comes down to going to CIM, and then I go to Wisconsin, uh, Madison, which you mentioned Feldenkrais early, earlier. Uh, my teacher Uri Vardy was just, you know, incredible influence on me as well. Uh, I was there for a bit, and then moved back to Chicago, uh, where I was living with my uh, fiance, Hina, who's now the artistic producer of the Ravinia Festival. What? Uh, so, yeah. Okay. Just as of as of ten days ago. Wow! wow. Congratulations. Yeah. Heard yeah. here <laughs> first, folks. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so shout TMZ out to her. exclusive. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Taking notes exclusive. Um, but yeah, so I, I was in Chicago and was kind of figuring out where my next steps were. I was actually uh, not to bring it back to basketball, but I was. Bring I was it. like, man, bring well, it. maybe I should like get some training sessions. I've never done that before, and like I'm just chilling. I'm, I was playing principal of a few regional orchestras who were. Uh, which were great and they're awesome opportunities. And uh, so I I'm like emailed this guy, Trevor Huffman, who's like a, a D1 basketball player, like did did some, played a little bit for the Suns, uh, super nice guy, amazing writer actually. And, uh, and yeah, he put me through these like 30 minute workout sessions and it was like, you know, not that, not that bad. And so I did that like once every two weeks so I was like, I'm just, I'm just doing this. I'm living life. 
And then, you know, I decided to essentially write to Annie because I, I really wanted to uh, do something with chamber music still. And Cavani was really close to me. And, and, uh, and I didn't have too much going on other than, you know, these, these things in Chicago. Um, and, and I also felt like personally, I had something to give to the Cavani quartet. I feel like studying with Mary and knowing them so well, I, I knew how to fit in with the group. I'd played with Annie since I was like 11 or 12. And I, I felt like I had something to offer there. And so I wrote to them, I said, Hey, I, you know, I don't know where things are at. At this point, they had just left CIM. And that's, you know, a story for another day. I have my own feelings on that. And I feel like mm-hmm. that was not handled well mm-hmm. uh, by the school's part. And I think they're still kind of experiencing ramifications for that. But essentially, just like, I, if you need, if you're looking for a cellist, if you're thinking about still continuing on, just let me know. I'd love to at least just come play, you know, just, just hang out with you guys. And so they invited me to play um, a concert actually at, at my mom's program in like February of 2019. And it was just a super fun week. We put together a few pieces, um, you know, some classics, Dvorak American, of course, uh, of course, you know, Washington Midnight Child, which is a piece I've played for a while since uh, growing up at, at CMC, and then Beethoven Opus 18 number two. And it was just, it went really well. And we got along well. I've known Eric Wong, the violist for a long time. Um, knew of Catherine quite well. So um, yeah, it's just a good fit. And so it worked out and they invited me to join the quartet. And it's crazy. It's already been, you know, two, two plus years with them. Wow. So It's amazing. It feels like you, you it's partly destiny. <laughs> it was Cinderella's glass slipper. You know, you were, you were trained for it and, and you were bred for that, that role. And so it's beautiful to see you, you know, metamorphose into, that uh that position and and i can't wait till y'all come out to la and and rock the house man you gotta Dude, let me know that'd be awesome that would be awesome <laughs> yeah yeah get some viola quintets going man Mendelsohn, oh come on amazing. yes please do man. it <laughs> i need something to do <laughs> <laughs> we'll probably keep coming back and weaving in and out of the sports metaphors but <laughs> looking at football there's a lot of people on the field it's orchestral there's, the roles are pretty delegated. They're very specific. You're training someone's body for that specific role. But at least to me, and I'd be curious to hear your thoughts on this, it seems like string quartets and the smaller chamber music is more like basketball to where there's not as many people on the court. You have to really, you can really stand out as an individual, but you must work as a unit. Everyone's obsessed with the no look pass. We love the no look pass. We love all the trick shot and just knowing where everyone's going to go at the end of the game. When the reporter walks up and they ask LeBron, Oh, can you tell us what you were thinking at the end of the third quarter? And then he runs down a mental picture of like where everyone was standing and what everyone was doing and thinking. And they just sit there in awe of like the beauty of his memory and just knowing like, how did you know someone was six feet back, two feet over to the left to pass him there. And he just knew because it's like chamber music. What is string quartet to you? What is chamber music to you? Chamber music to me is a conversation on all levels. I think it's it's a time and, and a forum for being very intimate and open with your friends and with those who are there to listen. And I think no matter what piece you're playing, like you just played a concert yesterday, uh, we're doing this eight concert Beethoven cycle Cavani is doing right now. I love that. Yeah, it's it's mm. epic. Um, but just taking every movement as like a different conversation, you know, the composers kind of laid out the topics and you're there <laughs> to, you know, comment on it. Just like we're, we're commenting on on questions. You know, there's there's an improvisatory nature in quartet playing that I think is fun and underrated. It's important to plan, work through the rehearsals, plan what you want to do, you know, all that stuff. What are the things we're going through? But in the performance, it's fun to both like search a little bit deeper in yourself and like give that extra something out to people, to, to your fellow quartet mates, but also to, you know, like maybe, maybe I'm going to like signal, oh, we're going to take a little bit more time here. Or maybe I catch that someone's going to do something spontaneous. And in the moment, like there's something really magical about that. So I think playing into the conversation elements and the improvisation elements of quartet playing within the structure that's provided, 
uh, is what makes it really fun. You sound like a jazz cellist when you talk about it in that way. And I know it's like improvisation, but the way you described it is literally the form of jazz. You have a tune, you know, you have an A section and a B section. Everybody knows exactly how that's supposed to go. And then in between, there's this conversation that's unique that is being created in real time. Therefore, it makes it infinitely interesting to perform because if you're an audience member and a player, if you're just there in that moment, what you're hearing at that moment will never happen again. And there's something mm-hmm. so special about that. And I love how you describe gym music like that. That's well put. Yeah, no, totally. I think the, um, I mean, I, I love jazz too. I, I don't play jazz much, but uh, with a different group of my sister and two best friends, uh, Andy and Aaron, this group Casa and we've done a lot of kind of crossover genre stuff for a while and uh, and it's you know it roots from the I think the Kuroga vibe too which is the music festival I run in upstate there is this sense of like being in the moment being spontaneous and creative but still you know having enough communication established as a group uh, or chemistry to to also be on the same page continuously so it's not like there's surprises that come across the wrong way or anything like that it's everyone's really geared in together and and part of that is also i think just being able to hang out with people outside of rehearsal too and um it's fascinating to me uh how (laughs) body language and um how you can get really good at reading someone's mind uh through chair music uh Feel mm. feel pretty confident as a mind reader currently, so, uh, <laughs> though I'm you know not I'm, I want it, I'd have to have a cello in my hand and everyone else would have to be playing. Too. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of Kuroga, mm-hmm. so if we had stopped it right here and we just like kept digging into your experience playing in string quartets and reg- regional orchestras and basketball and all this, you'd have already had a badass career, <laughs> and yet. Now we're going to talk about this other massive thing on top of that, which is the Kroger Music Festival. For those who don't know, we just give a little bit of introduction and tell us about the trajectory it's been over the past few years. Kroger Lake Music Festival started in 2012. I was a sophomore at CIM, or I just finished my sophomore year there. And it, it was very innocent, uh, honestly. <laughs> it was like, I was like, oh, it'd just be fun to like play chair music with friends and do it in a place I love, which is this small um, kind of Adirondack lake town. Um, and my sister and I, Stephanie Price Wong, who's a violist and teaches at Ohio University, she, you know, was uh, also there with me. I think the previous year we saw that this little chapel, which is essentially in our backyard, uh, was doing on some little event. And there was a bunch of people there. And we're like, oh, wow, there's maybe something here for for music or for some sort of event. And so we just kind of kept playing with that. And I, I wanted to invite some of my friends to come play and we just take donations and, and, you know, um, call it a day, call it a festival. Uh, <laughs> but, but, you know, so we had like eight musicians. We all stayed in my grandmother's house. Um, we we're all packed in sleeping in kitchen and living room. I was on a, you know, a chair, for a week and we were just having fun and my family was super amazing at being open to having that many people i may or may not have told my grandma until like two weeks before and i had already think everything already set up and you know she's kind of the last one in but uh but she was great about it um and so essentially from there it just grew a lot the, a lot of people came to the concerts um, there was a lot of cold calling SPAC and other presenters and just saying, Hey, can we play pre-show or something like that? You know? Mm-hmm. And they were like, yeah, provided a really great platform for us to just kind of get to know the community better and, and really just have fun as, as a group of musicians, we would go like water skiing and kneeboarding and then, you know, play cornhole and basketball mm-hmm. and, and then we go swimming and then like, of course, yeah, rehearse, do our thing and, and, uh, and have fun with that. But I think it was, you know, really what it came down to is it had the right vibe from the beginning and every year it grew. Uh, we brought pretty much twice as many people 
twice as many concerts, longer festival. And then about four years later, I decided to like make it a nonprofit under the Arts Collective title, Kroger Arts Collective, which then allowed it to be a bigger umbrella. So we could bring music festival, Your Body is Your Strat, which is my teacher Uri Vardy's program from Wisconsin. And then also do interdisciplinary artistic activities. So combining music and poetry and, and visual art. And that's still, I feel like, the longer trajectory that we haven't quite reached yet. But the music festival has become you know, very popular. And last year we had uh, probably and close to 80 musicians. And this is still the time mm. where we had to reduce a little bit for COVID, go from five mm. weeks to four weeks and just make sure we could get a good program in. But we've been having some really great artists. It's not just classical music. There's musics of all types and they collaborate together. So like Sierra Hall, who's a fantastic mandolin player, was there. Mm -hmm. And there's been so many interesting uh, things. Just one quick side note, the the fascinating thing about doing these kind of um, programs is that you meet people in the community and people that you never knew existed right next door. And not only do you get to meet them, but you get to like meet their friends and get to learn about all these circles that exist that you just would not even imagine. So for for one of them, we met this guy, Steve Smith, who's on our board now. And he happened to be the CEO for L.O. Bean, which is up in Maine. Ooh, and he was just, company. yeah. <laughs> and he was just, you know, hanging out, super nice guy, loved the music. And he's like, oh, you should come, come to my garage. My cousins are playing here tonight and it'll be super fun. And normally, you know, part of us is like okay cousins playing in the garage like, yeah i don't know <laughs> you know m- murder you know yeah, yeah. <laughs> we'll see my garage kid yeah. Yeah. Like, <laughs> you know wear me as their skin suit yeah, you know. <laughs> Classic. yeah. so we were, we were just like okay well we'll we'll have our concert and then we'll just do our thing but then um jeremy manning one of our friends there uh who lives in the community was like are you gonna go to steve's like garage concert I'm like i don't know maybe and he's like, oh, there's this group playing there. His cousin's a part of this group called Third Story. And uh, they're they're pretty well known. It's like Richard Saunders, who's now, and this is his cousin, who's on tour with Chance the Rapper. And, you know, these these other two singers who are just insanely amazing. Playing with Jeff Saunders, who was in the O'Connor band at the time. So anyway, these cousins ended up being like really well-known musicians. Mm-hmm. And then they just got involved with the festival. And it became this kind of insane moment of just like wow it's all around you just like you have to go talk to your neighbors and like be open and vulnerable and things happen wow so see i come to my backyard concert you know with lincoln lincoln park you know yeah. <laughs> <laughs> wow so this festival it's grown you've gotten some massive donations you've got um you know the 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 faking notes podcast uh, roster showing up with Ken <laughs> and Nathan and everyone and our very own producer Daniel who's on the call shout out to mm-hmm. producer Daniel um so it's this huge thing and just going off of their socials they're having a good time there it's something fun they want to do it like they're showing up they could go anywhere else these are very talented musicians, very talented cellists. They could go anywhere, else, but they want to go to Kuroga because it's a good experience uh, and they like you and they like what you're doing. How did you, is it just because that's part of the origin story? Like it was a great excuse to do something nice and hang out with friends and water ski that you kind of instilled the, the funness into the DNA uh, or like, how do you, how do you keep it fun and how do you keep great musicians showing up? Hmm. That's a, it's a really tough balance uh in the sense of balancing fun and then like productivity and and actually creating a product that people are really psyched about not just the 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 audience members but the musicians themselves um Mm. i'd say when we were in college and undergrad people were just psyched to like go play music with friends that they really liked um to meet maybe some new friends to play in a community where people recognize you in the you know, local grocery store because you play music and you know, there's kind of this local fame thing that develops and, or, you know, my friend Aaron wears a bandana and suddenly a bunch of people in the community are wearing a bandana because <laughs> they think he's really cool. You know, like these, <laughs> these like weird things that classical musicians don't experience, you know, much. I think that was part of it. There was kind of a cool aura with that, but also, you know, I think there is an element of, oh, okay, we're used to like, 
you know, myself included, paying a lot of money to go to a festival to, you know, study with a great teacher to work on our craft, um, to then like flip it around. And even if we're paying each other the first year, like 50 bucks each, you know, from these donations that we're actually going to be like paying ourselves through this and then growing that year after year. Um, Mm. that I think made it feel very much like a team, a team vibe that like everyone's helping contribute to this thing. Uh, and so, yeah, I think I had the right, the right balance, but, you know, year after year, uh, we, we talk about, you know, how do we kind of keep it chill enough where people aren't getting overwhelmed or overworked, but at the same time, like put in the amount of rehearsals we need to like, you know, play Schoenberg for Klartenacht at like a super high level that everyone's happy with, or like do some weird crossover project that no one was envisioning that like, you know, we're (laughs) combining like these rare art forms and like no one really knows what's going on, but we're all just going for it. Like that kind of stuff, I think, um, makes it, makes it difficult, but, but worth it in the end. Mm. I I love that, man. I think that what is really, you said it as a person who used to go to summer festivals, there is a real occurrence where you're overworked. You know, you got people sitting out because they're they're dealing with tendonitis because they're just playing eight hours every single day. But also what was so interesting about your explanation was like your awareness of music being a product, like what you do for people is the product. And I think that especially in the classical world, there's like this aversion to like seeing things like, no, it's art, man right? This isn't a product, (laughs) but when you are playing for people and they're donating, they're giving their time and attention to you, you have to give them a reason. Mm -hmm. And I love that. I love that you really think about that aspect. Yeah. From the socials uh, and and what people are posting, there's, I know the musicians there have a, have a good time. I'm, I'm usually working pretty intensely, (laughs) uh, but I keep updated. I, I see sometimes of what they post. I remember in the early years, um, maybe in the one of the first years Ken was there, he was doing these weekly videos, um, yes. still, even at that point, about mm-hmm. what it was like. And uh, there was like, there was barely an instrument in these videos. Like, you know, it was just everyone hanging out, like doing their thing. And I was like, Ken, dude, like at least put one video of us like playing our actual <laughs> instruments. Like otherwise, like our, my donors are going to be looking at this like this is what I'm giving money to. Like it's just hanging out. Just <laughs> <enjoy it>, right? <laughs> um, but anyway, so he was, he was great about it though. And obviously, probably a lot of you have seen uh, Ken's awesome videos, but there's quite a few from the music festival in the summer mm-hmm. that are on his channel. And then once Nathan got there, that was that was a whole nother whole nother level Uh, level. nathan's my guy like love Mm. nathan man so when you're trying to scale an endeavor like this what are what are some key things you're thinking about um what are some key conversations that you're having in order to take this from you know this cool little arts thing they're doing the adirondacks the southern adirondacks and taking it and scaling it to where it's a destination for the highest quality musicians, what are, what are some frameworks you have mentally? Hmm. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. I mean, I think focusing on the experience, um, there's the artist experience, there's the audience experience. I would even say a community experience is slightly different than audience experience because there's people that come from outside of the community. Uh, and focusing on what does that experience look like? What does that feel like? And having that lead where you make decisions and how you curate things or the vibe of sorts that you want for those things uh, does have a big impact. I also feel like, you know, whether this answers your question or not completely, one thing that I I feel like I've done well and I've been lucky, frankly, is to have a lot of creative people around me and to know when when you're going to learn, you know, this extra task so that you can do it yourself or pass it off to someone who really does it well and knowing that you can rely on them, whether it's a community member, a board member, uh, or, you know, someone uh, like a fellow musician who does something incredible. My, my fiance, Hina, who I mentioned earlier, 
was just as like so organized and so good at you know you know production and administration and and marketing and so like let her like run with it and and really yeah. help me like teach me about like how we can do certain things to to make it successful or my mom with CMC or my sister um, who you know helps run CMC as well really learning from the people around you and putting them in a place to succeed I think actually allows everything to grow faster. And sometimes that trust can be, especially for like a founder, it can be really hard to let go of certain things, but you need to like in order for it to grow. Yeah. I, it's, yeah. it's the universe is crazy. Okay. Cause this is exactly <laughs> what I needed to hear. This is what I needed to hear personally. So thank you for bringing that to the faking fam. <laughs> Anything I can do. <laughs> So you've got this little project, little hangout from 2012, and then you're having a good time, you're having fun, it's growing, bigger musicians, more experiences, the team's growing, massive donations, and you're like, you know what's going to make this really fun? An amusement park. Will you tell us a little bit about uh, (laughs) Sherman's amusement park? Yeah. No, thanks for bringing that up. Uh, Man. So Sherman's was this kind of iconic place for for decades. It was founded in the 20s, had some of the most brilliant musicians there doing big band music, really for the first 30 years in particular of its opening. And then from there, kind of transferred over to being more of a standard amusement park rather than just like a big band dance hall. And went through, you know, kind of a, a huge escalation in its growth, attracted a bunch of people to the area, the population grows, the business, the revenue grows in the area. And then maybe around the 80s, those kind of smaller amusement parks start to die out. You start to see like Cedar Point, Six Flags start to grow. And suddenly like the like kind of more chill family fun is not as valued anymore. And this is the story of the Adirondacks and a lot of the areas like that as well that mm-hmm. were kind of in that in that mode. And so with that, you see the population start to decrease uh, because people are moving out or generations are dying away. You start to see the businesses die out just even in this little town. And so what you have is like still a lot of amazing people there, a lot of people who care about the area. Then you have like a amusement park who's been what's, you know, that's been largely unused for about 20 years Um, and the buildings are falling down, the Ferris wheels, not looking great. And with that, you know, there was kind of, a huge political circus around this amusement park. And for me growing up around that, I was kind of saw the the early nineties, mid nineties had like just a snippet of like still going to the Ferris wheel and the carousel just a little bit. Um, and I, I know like that experience means a lot to a lot of people. So essentially what happened was I think in 20, around 2014. So like third year of the music festival, I, I kind of start having this larger concept in mind, this arts collective. And uh, I also went to the Your Bodies, Your Strad program in Madison and started thinking about my mom's program, which is a great education program, working with the youth, Your Bodies, Your Strad, which I felt like was a great place for like positive creativity, exploration, growth in this way. So I started thinking like, how, how can I combine these things and how do I create a platform where not only I can be creative with different things that come to mind, but I can put all my friends in position to like put their ideas in play. And like, how do I create that platform overall? And so then with that, it's like, how do I create a facility that can host something like that? And so then you start getting into the amusement park. And Mm. uh, I felt like it was a great place for an artist community or an arts and education center. And I felt like I had the connections to make it happen and that, you know, the artists, we had built enough of a kind of reputation locally that we could support that. And my friend Kier Gogwilt, who I don't know if some of you might know, but he's a fantastic violinist. And he came to Kroger the first couple of years. He was really encouraging. I'm like, you should pursue this. You should do this. It's like, it, it can really work. He's a founding member of this group called Amok, American Modern Opera Company, mm-hmm. um, which have done a fair amount in the New York and kind of California areas. But anyway, so 
I, I went for it. I was like, we're going to put this proposal in to the town. We're going to see how it goes. And uh, we want to turn this in at arts and education space. And then it was amazing because I've never done that many town halls and town board mm-hmm. meetings in my life for the next five years trying to get this property. And you have people call you all sorts of names. People can be really threatening to you. Uh, you have people saying, like, I remember one guy was like, this kid's saying they're going to be in the next glimmer glass. No way. No way. <laughs> and like, you know, like deep doing cut. These, nice. Yeah. <laughs> doing these big, like public displays of like calling us sissies and stuff, you know, like the whole wow. thing, the whole thing just, what? and like, just so determined, like, I'm going to make this happen because I know this is the right spot, not just for the music festival, but for this project. Mm-hmm. But I also know it's right for the town. Mm-hmm. I know that it's, it's, it's the right thing to, be an attraction, be a destination for the next generation. Family fun amusement parks might not be like the attraction anymore, but having a really interesting space for artists to create, for audience members to come in, to have an interesting experience and something that is fun for the community to be a part of, that that is something that can be attractive. And it, was, it wasn't even until later on that I learned through Hina, who was working at Ravinia and still is, um, that Ravinia was actually an amusement park originally. And it was turned into a music mm. festival. So then I started diving in there and thinking about like, how did that happen? Even though it was a hundred years ago. And yeah, I don't know. From there, it was just a, it was a whole, it was a whole game. Did my like doctoral project on, on Kuroga and was able to like make it happen. And we still have some doubters, but really the community has come around and we've got the Ferris wheel lit, the carousel running. We have concerts. People are using the main building. We're having making doing recordings where these big bands used to play that were, you know, it's it's amazing acoustic space. So it's it's a journey though, I have to say. Like we're still very far, but it's been really fun. In doing research for this conversation, like it what you say is really true. Like before you all were donated this this theme park, like it was in a it was kind of in disrepair. It wasn't being used. It reminds me of like, in some ways, humans are like hermit crabs, right? We are born in this area and we outgrow the shell and we leave it. But what happens to that shell? Sometimes it's abandoned. And so what what's interesting is like, you're showing, you're a true like case study in art being a way for humans to gather together to become this hermit crab, inhabit a space that was once abandoned revamp it revive it and make it greater than it ever was before and i'm just wondering like have you had any particular mentors that have kind of helped you come to this conclusion or how how did you kind of discover this opportunity um to do that yeah that's a great analogy on how to put it too i like that i'd say like inspiration wise obviously like there's a lot of a lot of people around me that have been entrepreneur like my family have been entrepreneurs for a long time. So I, I feel like that must play an influence. And also I think uh, a lot of people locally, a lot of like business people and people who end up being on my board and my advisory council and some of the musicians all like contribute and will, will call me and like talk about it. I've had a bunch of musicians play at like town board meetings, like play music. We had one session I remember in particular where people were just like so angry about what was going on with Sherman's when the town was owning it that I was like, you know, it's one of our first big meetings where people were like, well, what is this arts group and what do they want to do with it? And I was like, well, I think the easiest way is just to like get people to play. So we played like, I don't know, we played like Shasti 10th string quartet, like yes. you know, the really intense <laughs> movement. Out. Yeah. And like, <laughs> I had a whole like emotional trajectory of this program. Like, they just finished a meeting with the town board where people were just like super pissed. And I was like, okay, so we're going to do Shasti first. Let people get their anger out and like also let them stay pissed. Yeah. Let them stay pissed. (laughs) And I'm going to transition this. We're going to do like uptown funk in the middle with like my brother-in-law and like a few of us, you know, Ken's going to play this thing with, with him or whatever. And then at the end, we're going to play like first movement mental sonarctet. And like, everyone's just going to be like, holy crap, this is like, this is it. And that's kind of how it worked. I mean, like it, it kind of worked where at the end, people were just like, how can I help? I want to be involved. This is what we need. 
I found like I'd say eighty percent of my board members came to the to to the forefront like that night um, to wow. us. Yeah. So weird things like that, I'd say, help inspire it all to like happen. Uh, but. It's beautiful and something that just resonated me with me about your story too. So, you know, you grow up in Ohio, you're playing basketball, <laughs> you, you take your talents to South Beach, you go into conservatories, but you come back and you, you're, you're going to win that ring for, for the small town. So many of, you know, of our colleagues, myself included, grow up smaller towns there's vibrant communities in here and certainly in ohio there's a lot of art there but where's the jobs where's the big stuff where you know where where can i really like edge my teeth on this craft we go to new york we go to la we go to chicago and certain genres go to nashville or something Mm -hmm. and we can get stuck there it's kind of hard to go back we know Mm -hmm. it's a lot of work the community that maybe didn't understand us growing up necessarily Mm -hmm what we were doing. It, it, it's like when I look back at that small part of North Carolina where I grew up, I'm like there is an arts community there and I need to go back and I need to do something for them because yeah. there's so many artists. Like I wouldn't have popped out of there if there wasn't a community or some type of bedrock. But mm-hmm. when a lot of people reach success, they will wind up in these cities and it's just so difficult to go back. But what I really mm-hmm. resonated with was that you did you, you, you're yeah. still traveling around, you're playing at a high level, playing with high level groups, but you've put in real time and real mm-hmm. energy into these small overlooked hermit crab shells. Mm-hmm. Was that like a, a natural? Did you like grapple with this? Like, why don't I move just to New York and, you know, do the grind there or whatever? Like, what made you say like, no, I'm going to do the other, another hard choice. It's always hard, but the other mm-hmm. hard choice of going back to Kuroga, going back to Ohio. Mm-hmm and mm. cultivating art in these areas? It's a great question. Why did I do that? No, I, I think, <laughs> you know, part of me feels like I've been doing that already. I, I don't know. I've been doing it since I was an undergrad. I, I kind of had some connection throughout. It was continuous. But as I left school, I did start to find ways to invest my time in those areas more and more. And I would say, like, one thing that I... For anyone listening, that I would suggest like, and I definitely have to figure this out either. But as you as you get deeper into a project, no matter what it is, it's like a gravity thing. You personally feel more connected to it, and you want to spend more time with it, and it wants you to spend more time with it too. It's like the other way somehow exists as well. And so with that, and when you're doing multiple things, it's like how do you balance your time and energy so that you feel like you're doing it the best you can with each of those projects that you're working on. And that's a continual process for me. So whether it's Cavani, Kuroga, or, you know, Casa, the group I play with with my friends, it does take energy, time and energy. And it it is a balance to figure out how that fits together. But I would say for me, just a second ago, you're talking about like going back to North Carolina and like searching for for things in, in the big city and, and these you know these places the the destination point I think or I, I want to tell myself is always like is always inside it's never like something external outside right so it's like the further you go in and like further pursue that destination which is your vision which is you know I I have this vision of I'm going to do this or this or X, Y, Z. That leads you, that brings your your physical self places. That's what keeps it going. So you could be anywhere in the world, small town, big town, whatever. But if you feel like you're pursuing that like authentically, then I feel like it over time it catches on. And then people, people want to be a part of that or they find it interesting. Um, And it's not something where it's like you're, it's not material where I'm like actively looking to like bring people in in that way. But sometimes you just get fixated on things. And it's, it's, I think it's okay to pursue the fixations to an extent, but it's okay. Yeah. I want to highlight what you said just now, Kyle, because I, I myself have like found this to be true. A lot of times we don't, we, we think it's kind of woo woo to like write down your goals and to have a make a vision board and like dream the life that you want to have 
But if you think about it practically and zoom out, if you don't know where you're going, you can just walk around in circles, right? So like figuring out what you want and envisioning what it looks like just simply gives you a direction to walk. Like there's no point in in grinding if you're just going to grind in a zigzag pattern and and you don't ever get any anywhere. And and so one thing that I really wanted to you know ask you and especially highlight for the faking fam is like okay so you had this vision, right? Hmm. What I imagine there's like a kid who's about who's like maybe a sophomore in their undergrad who's listening mm-hmm. to this, right? They just got and glitter bombed and the they dog. just got <laughs> glitter bombed. They're like, man, what am I going to do with my life, yeah. right? And, and and what what advice would you give that musician that you know is from a small town or knows of a small town has tiny connections and they want to start a project like this from scratch? What would you say needs to be their first three steps? Hmm. I'd say two steps that I, I tend to live by, just really oversimplifying for a second. Oversimplifying. Is, yeah, is um, the first step is dream the life. And you probably know where my second step is going. Uh, second step is live the dream. So <laughs> the first step, dream the life, is essentially what do you, what do you envision? What do you want to do? And, and I think it's important when you do this to – not filter yourself too quickly. So you don't need to justify to Bobby Joe down the street who barely knows you, but you think might think this idea is weird if you were to do it. Like that, this kind of irrational thinking, I think, comes into people's minds. And they don't even start to do something because they're like, ah, well, like, you know, there's not a lot of people who play checkers and like paint at the same time. And so I don't think I'm going to do that. But like maybe you do that really well and maybe that's what you really want to do. And so like my, my thing I feel it is important is to be unapologetic about what your interests are and to pursue them, um, you know, and to allow yourself to go down that path. So, so yeah, dream the life, live the dream is it's, it's an action. So now that you've laid the groundwork, like you're saying, Drew, about, where you want to go, like, how do you get there? You know, what are the steps that you want to do to, to, to get there? Some of it is very simple. It's just like, it's like a magnet point once you like dream the life, because then you just naturally start, even if you have a few side, side things, you know, it kind of just brings you that place. Um, you know, it's, (laughs) it's funny. It's like you play a C major chord on a piano, right? And then you do a bunch of these crazy things and you're just making stuff up and you're all over the place in your head. You just constantly want to go back to that C major chord, like (laughs) kind of like there's always something back in there and somehow it might find your way back, you know, Mm -hmm. or if you're really committed, if you really want to go to D major, you know, you might have the tools to get there in the way that's like formally accepted in, in a theoretical sense. But also, who cares? Like, if you just get there and you play a D major chord, like, if that's if that's your destination point, then, you, then you've made it. So I think mm-hmm. for people, there's, number one, is also there's, there's not technically a right or a wrong way to pursue something like this, especially if you're doing it for yourself and, and if it's kind of something that you're ex- exploring. Like, curiosity mm-hmm. and exploration are really key to like moving forward. Um, And I think sometimes people look for like the perfect manual of how to like accomplish something. But I think sometimes you lose that sense of like self-discovery that happens through this curiosity and discovery. And that actually goes to Feldenkrais real quick, which is like, it's so important to be like self-observant and then also to be like a child, right? Like, there's, there's a curiosity. So I'm not like judging the way I move my arm. I'm just like, okay, today I move my arm this way and this is how it feels. And like, if I release something here, like suddenly, okay, now I can do this. Like, uh, it's, it's all just kind of observation and curiosity. So I would say, you know, feel free to write down your, your, your dream list, pursue it. Um, also maybe if I had to throw in a third step, um, Drew, I think, being able to connect with others, be personable, 
be friendly and cherish your friends um, mm-hmm. and cherish those who, you know, you barely know also. Um, it's not just because it's the right thing to do, uh, but it also is you learn so much about yourself and there's so much possibility, creative possibilities that come from the people you know. So I think sometimes people overlook that or they they have they go on this self mission of like I'm going to accomplish this and I don't need anyone else around me to like make it happen. <clears throat> I got this. But you know, it's good to lean on your friends. Um so those I don't know. Those that's what came to mind. That's such a good question. Thank oh, you. I wanted yeah. to read a Kobe quote <laughs> going with that Love theme. It. So those times when you get up early and you work hard, those times when you stay up late and you work hard, those times when you don't feel like working, you're too tired, you don't want to push yourself, but you do it anyway. That is actually the dream. That's the dream. It's not the destination, it's the journey. And if you guys can understand that, then that's what you'll see happen is that you won't accomplish your dreams, your dreams won't come true, something greater will. Hmm. That's, that's powerful. That's uh, mm-hmm. but that he lived that way, right? It's like mm-hmm. he, Mamba mentality, Mamba yeah, Mamba. for sure. Man, yeah, he. I don't know. There's something about Kobe too, though. That like, you know, he's like the most fluid player. Like for someone who's so focused on hard work, right? It's not like he's showing that much effort on the court. Like there's the effort, the sweat, right? But like there's a fluidity, there's an effortlessness to how he shoots and how he plays that like i think is so fascinating right like Mm -hmm. and even as a performer to like relate to that think of some of these greatest performers like we know technically what they're playing is insanely difficult we're sitting there like oh god i could never do this how many hours do you have to practice (laughs) but yet they look effortless up there Mm -hmm. it's almost like they're dancing it's almost like they're on the court they're in the championship game but it doesn't seem like it like they are there to do their job. And then yeah. like with this quote, there's something you mentioned you know, with living this dream and like visualizing this dream, dreaming the dream up is that it, it, it does give you where you want to go, but not necessarily how. And that if you're mm-hmm. just pursuing it and if you're at least heading somewhat in the right direction, um, like Kobe's quote, it's like you will exceed that dream. The dream won't come true. You're going to accomplish something mm-hmm. better and bigger than you ever saw it before. Like, I don't know necessarily for you, you're a sophomore, you go up there, I'm going to play with friends. And you're like, no, this would be nice to keep going. This would be something I could see this going somewhere. I don't think you imagine then, man. And so, you know, like five years, we're going to go play in front of the town board to get an amusement (laughs) park. Like, (laughs) right, right. What a great dream. What a great dream. That's a really good point. And I think there's also, Sometimes with Kuroga, at least, it was a convergence of different dreams and then kind of a, a like light bulb moment of like, oh, like if I take this project and like this project and actually interlace them, it, it really makes sense. It really works. Um, so, yeah, being strategic about stuff. But I love that that idea of just like like you're saying, the journey and learning more and actually ending up at this place that you couldn't even envision at the beginning. Like that's, that's so powerful, but definitely resonates with, with musicians, I think across the board. This is very important. I think as well, I just turned 30 a couple of weeks ago. So it's, it's kind of like, Congrats. thank you. I'm still here. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and you know, I never, it's, it's hard when you're like a 12 year old starting out on a, on a journey, right? You're starting out on learning your instrument. I couldn't even imagine what I'd be like at 30, but I'm far, I'm both farther along and not as far along hmm. on this journey as I thought. And anytime I ever, anytime I'm really depressed is when I'm not growing is when I'm not really progressing and learning more. And I think this conversation has kind of unlocked something for me personally in that there's so much more to learn. Like when you get a master's degree in an, in a string instrument, you're not playing a game of like millimeters, right? You're getting better, but just by like centimeters at best until you realize like 
until you learn more about the world and learn more about what is possible. And then it seems impossibly impossible mm. to achieve. Like there's so much more to, to do. And I think the true happiness, like from that Kobe quote, and just like from what I've learned from you today, Kyle is like the happiness comes from learning from growing. Mm. And I'm now like feeling really committed to and, and inspired to, to grow and to mm. continue to get better. So I just want to thank both of you for this conversation. Cause I'm, I'm on fire right now. That's amazing. I love that. Yeah. The learning aspects. And I, I think it's funny because learning can, you know, when you think about it, when you're like in school, maybe in middle school, learning is like, oh, I have to go yes, I just want to like goof <laughs> off. <laughs> yeah. But, but yeah, learning is like, I think thinking about it more like um, experiencing and like expanding your horizons. And, and also as we get older, uh, another felt in Christ thing, but you have to be, you have to remember as a kid, you weren't perfecting things on first go. We were almost more patient as kids to like try stuff because we didn't have this expectation of like playing like Yo Yo Ma right from the get go. Or we might think we are, but we're just kind of like <laughs> enjoying it. You know, we're just having fun. And that having fun and enjoying it is so important during the process. So mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah, I just want to throw that on top. That was, that was beautiful, Drew. I agree. That's such a great point. Like the idea of play is entirely evaporated. Like every every bit of joy must become a side hustle. Uh, I have to pay my taxes. So I got to, you know, I can't be doing a fun, dumb thing. But I, I don't know, at least for me and maybe even for Drew and most of our listeners, like at this turning point of 30, it's like I figured out my why, my dream. Mm -hmm. When I like, help in, enable artists to have more careers, create more mm. artists to help them be better, more wholesome people who then can in turn go out and make even more art, make more music and help their communities. And so just like knowing that it's kind of weird because that's like, that's like fairly focused. Like there's some specific things, you know, talk about their money, talk about the mental health, talk about, you know, read Kobe quotes off yahoo.com during podcasts. Like there's so many different things we can do, but you know, it is, it's just that direction. And then embracing the fact that how we're going to get there is like, I have no idea how that it's just, but I'm just going to keep moving forward. It That's what wakes me up in the morning and gets me excited. And with that mm. reminding myself, well, how did we get to where we are to today and to be, to be a kid again and the learning, the creative mm. process to make mistakes and do dumb things uh, and just to not have the expectation of, of, of growth necessarily is actually what makes you grow. And so it is this weird thing, like to get a you know a bunch of adults in a room or a bunch of adults in there to like try to paint and suck at it. You know, it, it's like okay because we forget about that. Kids are allowed to suck, and as adults, I'm constantly suppressing myself, even when I'm going in to play some new music thing or, or or to sing or something. It's like I'm not a singer; I'm terrible at this. I know great singers; I can't do that. I know how much work it's going to take to get better at this, and so then we just simply don't, and then we're not growing. It's this weird thing that we have to get over. And I look out and I see happy people who've been chasing their dreams. They're still dealing with issues and problems. We all are. But the people who I see really moving closer to their goal, we're doing just like what you were doing. They're exploring their hobbies. They're testing out new things. They're playing. And they're getting a basketball coach to come out there and do training with them. What? How's that going to get me closer to my cello goals? I don't know, but I enjoy this and it's fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah it's amazing uh, that's that's so well put yeah i it's amazing i think i think just going full circle for a second to the to the earlier conversation too about basketball music is you can learn especially when you're working in those centimeters like drew you're talking about and masters is like you can learn something from a different art form that clicks in with what you're doing on your instrument and all of a sudden you're like oh like that's the breakthrough right and, uh, and for me, sometimes that happens. I mean, sometimes it, maybe, maybe it was just like, I just need to really like do this thing like over and over again and, and like ref refine it. But other times, you know, it's like, you know, even how to sit on a chair, uh, which I'm clearly still not doing well, but I, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, it was like, Oh, you know, in ballet, it's like, how do people balance on their toes for so long? Well, like you think about like the kind of opposing poles. Maybe you let you like are thinking high up with your head, 
but then your tailbone is like sinking closer to the ground, but you're on your toes and it like stabilizes you overall. So like maybe when I play cello, it's both about like being up, you know, a lot of in chamber music, they talk about being up. Maybe I can release my like lower back in my, in my tailbone area. So like I can create this really like nice sound still while also being up with my upper body, being able to differentiate things might, you might get that discovery in a totally different um, field than what you're doing with, with music. Mm. <sighs> Kyle, this has been so amazing. I, I'm, I'm glad that we had this moment to share with each other. Like I love, I love your perspective on life, on improvement. I love what I love your your altruism and your idea that you know we as artists it's kind of like a policey uh, oh, yeah. police's book artists as a citizen artists right? as citizen as a citizen <laughs> artists and as citizen you embody that <laughs> Juilliard <laughs> stuff but like yeah it's it, you embody that so deeply I, and. I'm curious, like, this is the last thing that I wanted to ask is like, is there a way that we as a faking fam or I as like Drew TVK can like provide value to what you're doing and grow, help grow what you're doing? Is there a way that we can be of service in that way? Oh, well, yeah. Thanks. I mean, I don't know if this is the proper time to plug things, but you know, if, please. If, no, this, it is. Is, why you're here. <laughs> this is why you're here, man. We're going up the red carpet. No, I appreciate that. I, yeah, I appreciate that. Um, yeah. I mean, I think if people want to learn more about like Kroger arts and, and just the journey we're going on out there, um, you know, you can visit, like we have some like Instagram and, and Facebook um, pages, but also, uh, like krogerarts.org has a lot of our events and also just like feel free to come hang out you can message me um like always happy to meet people and and there's a, you know a place for everyone and i think um you know that's that's one thing for sure Cavani is constantly doing things in cleveland um and you know if you're in the cleveland area we'd love to meet you we'd love to see you uh and i i think in general you know i just uh remind everyone that like uh, you know, every, I, I was at one summer camp, I, I think it was, I forget where it was, but maybe it was in Wisconsin. And someone was talking about like, uh, actually Ben Freed and I, I don't know if Ben Freed is a friend. He's a great cellist, um, also lives in LA. Um, he, he was talking about like the, the stress of conservatory life and, you know, sometimes feeling like we're in a very, jam-packed highway i think we're using some sort of car analogy um and feeling like everyone's trying to go down to like one lane and you're just trying to figure out your way to do that and then we started thinking it more about it and i remember we both were like well in a way though like just get meta for a second but like we're we all intrinsically have a different voice right None of us have ever existed before. Never, none of us are ever going to exist again. So we all, from from the get go, are on our own path. And it's true, like your lane might get closer with someone else's, but it inevitably is. It's on its own track. And so I think you have to remember, like within the stress, and I just say this to anyone, like you, you are special, and like you have your own voice, and just continue to trust that and pursue that. And I feel like you're going to, you know, end up uh, somewhere that you'll really enjoy. Uh, and so, to, you know, that's something that I feel like, you know, I, I wanted, could have heard earlier, but it's important, I think, for conserv- conservatory, but anyone really to, to hear that. Um, yeah. So I just want to mention that along with some of the leaving words of wisdom. <laughs> mm. I'm, I'm, I'm leaving it for Trevor because I've been hot. Okay. I wanted to close. With a LeBron quote. <laughs> yes. <too. laughs> LBJ. Um, I think, yeah, yeah. So I had to, yeah, we, we've been doing all this Kobe talk, but come on, like it's it's Ohio time. I'm just happy to be part of the Nike family. Oh, no, wait, that's the wrong quote. <laughs> 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 uh, <laughs> okay, but yeah, here we go. But a, a couple ones jump out. And these, these aren't as long, but a few. And it's when you have the respect from your teammates, it makes it a lot more comfortable. Another one, you have to be able to accept failure to get better. And the last one, I need music. It's like my heartbeat, so to speak. 
It keeps me going no matter what's going on. Bad games, press, or whatever. I need music. Hmm. That's amazing. It's a true artist right there. We LBJ. need to play a quartet for LeBron. There we go. Dude, <laughs> call me up, you know what I mean? Bro, like, yeah. When we were on the CIM basketball team, I was trying, man. I was yeah. so trying hard. I was, I don't know. I was like, how do I get to the Cavs players? We need a coach. We're totally out of shape. <laughs> We have no fundamentals. <laughs> I was really stressed out about it. And uh, I remember I went up to one of the Cleveland Orchestra violists, actually. And uh, uh, Richard, he's in the viola section. He's like six foot eight. He's super oh. tall. He played D1 basketball. I was like, hey, so like, you know, do you want to coach our basketball team? And I think he was just confused. And, and he's a super <laughs> nice guy. He's just like, and I was like, I'll email you. You know, we'll talk. And then I tried to tell CIM to recruit LeBron's kids for the Eurythmics program, but they didn't pursue that. And I was like, man, you guys are losing out. This is, this is an opportunity right here. So mm. anyway, I, I do think, you know, LeBron talk about someone who just like, he just goes for it and like starting a school in Akron doing all of his stuff. He doesn't like carry like people tell him just focus on basketball. He's like, nah, like I'm going to do my thing. I got and, like, you better. Space awesome. jam too. Like, <laughs> <laughs> but oh my yeah, God. It is, yeah it's funny it's something definitely to look for and i do see a lot of parallels in you for what you're doing you're on the journey and where you're gonna get a ring you're gonna you're gonna win that ring for ohio uh, at some point but thanks again kyle for coming on the podcast till next time thank you all